think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Matt Gurka. I uh, direct the Biostat, Biostat and Epi program of the CTSI, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Michael Wu for our July WBCTSI symposium. Um, Michael Wu is in the Public Health Sciences Division, where he's an assistant member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He arrived there uh, a year ago, since 2013. Prior to that, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. He was also part of their CTSA as well, so he, he knows the, the drill very well. Um, he received his, his BS in Mathematical and Computational Science from Stanford. He then went on and got a master's and a PhD in Biostatistics from Harvard, where he had a minor in Computational Molecular Biology and Genetics. Even at this early stage in his career, he has dozens of publications, both as first author and in collaborative in journals such as American Journal of Epidemiology, American Journal of Human Genetics, and Nature. Uh, he started off with a very successful uh, trajectory um, as a strong collaborative biostatistician. He's on a, uh, a number of NIH grants, both as co-investigator and as subcontract PIs as well. Uh, he has a lot of experience with grants uh, and um, with collaborations in general. Uh, and today he's going to be talking to you about the analysis of complex genomic data using recent advances in statistical science. So welcome, Dr. Luke. All right, thank you for the kind introduction. And so first and foremost, thank you all of you for coming to my presentation today. And of course, thank you, Dr. Greca, for the kind invitation. So I've really enjoyed my visit thus far. I've learned a lot about the interesting things that are going on here, the amazing things that are going on in biostatistics, as well as some of the other groups. And I'm going to use the opportunity now to talk about some of the things that we've been doing. And hopefully, you'll find some of it interesting. So uh, before I begin, I am a statistician, but I want to emphasize that first and foremost, uh, I'm, a I'm a statistical scientist. That's to say, besides developing and applying new statistical methodology, all right, my objective is really to use statistics to draw inference and to make meaningful scientific discoveries. All right, that's to say, use it to actually accomplish something useful besides just stati uh, pure statistical novelty. And so to that end, all right, much of what I do is focused on analysis of large scale omic data. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, I'm interested in using statistics to analyze, all right, some of the emerging omic studies that we've seen. So since 1996 and, and the emergence of gene expression arrays, there's been tremendous progress in high throughput biotechnology. And really this has culminated in the development of these so-called omic sciences, all right, which many of you are probably even more familiar with than I am. And so this includes fields such as genomics, which is very broad, including looking at uh, gen sort of traditional genetic analysis, as well as transcriptomics and other related topics. All right, things like metabolomics, where we study metabolites. All right, proteomics, where we look at proteins. All right, uh, epigenomics, which is very popular now with uh, acetylation, histone acetylation, and DNA and CPG methylation. All right, and microbiome and metagenomics is an expanding area, which I think is actually going to be probably one of the hottest areas, at least for the next few years, all right, until people grow tired of that. And once that happens, there's always additional omics, which are constantly arising. And one interesting one, which I've recently heard about, is exposomics, which is looking at now environmental exposures and the cumulative effect of all of the environmental exposures and toxicants to which an individual may be exposed throughout their lifetime and characterize of this. And of course, much of this and all of this omics is driven by the most important one, which is economics. All right. And with regard to that, I mean both economics in terms of costs, all right, in terms of actual monetary costs, and also with regard to time. All right, with all of these omics technologies, all right, it's, much of this is now high throughput, and it's given us a tremendous economy of scale where we can analyze thousands of samples in a fraction of the time that it would once have taken us to do things. With gene expression arrays, of course, we're looking at thousands of genes simultaneously versus where when, doing, when we were doing northern analysis, all right, we could look at maybe a handful at most with all sorts of radioactive stuff going on. All right. And so then the real question that I'm interested in, however, is how can we actually use this omics data to achieve something meaningful? That's to say, how do we use it within the context of biology, within the context of the clinic, or within just public health practice as well? And in my view, all right, as a statistician, as a statistical scientist, all right, the, link, the thing that links this is really statistical analysis. We generate tons of data, all right, and it's really about how we interpret this and how we use this in a meaningful fashion, 
All right, and to do that, this is really the objective of statistics. All right, so statistics, statistical science in the omics era. All right, statistics is, is primarily concerned with the question of inference. All right, and so you think, what does inference mean? Traditionally, if you take an English class, it means that we're, we're drawing conclusions. And obviously, whenever we collect data, that's really the ultimate objective. We want to draw conclusions from this data that can be informative within a biological setting. There are a number of challenges to this within the context of genomics and omics overall. There are some things which are simply unavoidable and that are simply part of the nature of the technology and of the field. All right, this includes the large number of features that we're now measuring simultaneously. So that millions of SNPs, all right, tens of millions of genetic variants if you're looking at sequencing data. All right, you're looking at thousands of genes, hundreds of proteins, and overall, it's just a lot of things that's coming simultaneously. All right, this is of course exacerbated by the fact that there's only limited availability of samples. Generally, our sample sizes are modest, and to actually draw inferences in this case that are reliable and reproducible is extremely challenging uh, given, the, given the, this difficulty. And what I found increasingly is that we oftentimes have very poor understanding of our own data. That's not necessarily to say we don't understand how our data were generated, but we don't understand the exact mechanisms by which these features influence outcomes, by which they, co they work synergistically with each other, they interact with other components of the genome uh, and the other types of omics in order to influence complex outcomes. All right. And so these are things which we're working towards and which as we answer more questions, we'll be able to, to move along much further. All right, but that being said, there are a whole bunch of challenges that we can address, all right? And so as statisticians, one of the things that, that frustrates us a lot is we deal a lot with, with studies where the technology itself is simply inappropriate for answering the question at hand. Um, this happens and there's simply no way around it. And the only way, sorry, there is a way around it, which is simply to, to start off with adequate study design. And that is at some place which is tremendously lacking. All right, you, and if you use a technology which is inherently inappropriate, you're never gonna be able to, to make meaningful inference on the question of interest from that particular data. Simultaneously, we deal very a lot with confounded study designs. That's to say, all right, you sequenced all of your cases on, on using one platform and all of your controls using a different platform then at the end of the day, any differences that you may find, you're never going to be able to distinguish that from the perfect confounding for, uh, resulting from uh, differences in the platforms that you may have used. And finally, all right, a lot of the statistical methods that, that have been used within the context of traditional uh, biology and medicine are simply inadequate within, for genomic data, all right? in part due to some of these challenges over here, the large dimensionality of the feature space, all right, the, our own poor um, understanding of how things work, and the limited incorporation of prior biological knowledge into these sorts of analyses. All of this makes uh, the, all of these pose a grand challenge as we move forward. So where, so where are these challenges with regard to the statistical methodology? I'll focus on that. Well, here's a standard workflow for any of these sorts of omics analyses, all right? So every single omics is different. There, of course, you're going to have to tailor these sorts of steps to the particular data at hand, but almost always this is the standard workflow that, uh, that I and my group work from, all right? So first and foremost, the most important step is in the design, all right? If you don't design your study right, there's nothing you can do to save it later. All right, and this is the most important part, and I encourage all of you to consult with Dr. Gurkha's group in doing this, all right? All too often, I end up with data where, sorry, you spent $6 million, but there's nothing that can be done with it. So this, you need to design an, the, the, these studies appropriately, and given the challenges from these types of omics studies, there are all sorts of fancy designs that are under development, and statisticians are coming up with interesting ways of gaining efficiency with regard to the number of samples and with regard to statistical power. All right, the next step is, of course, sample, sample collection and data generation. Um, sometimes now many of the samples are already collected. It's simply about, about generating the data. Of course, I say that's simple, but we, uh, we all know that that's a huge amount of work and a huge amount of money in and of itself, but I won't talk too much about that. Uh, and then on, after that, it's really where I usually play a bigger role. My group focuses on 
on the, uh, on the analysis end. Design is of the paramount importance, but I tend to like to dabble in these areas. So the first ty type of analysis that we, fo that we, that we work with is low level analysis, all right, which generally means data pre-processing. So this includes things such as merging your data so that you can link it with metadata and other sorts of variables of interest. All right? It also in involves normalization in qu where you make samples uh, comparable across, um, where you make your data comparable across samples, and most importantly, quality control. Um, oftentimes with a lot of these types of genomic studies, I, we spend months and months in quality control, and then the actual analyses later only take about a week or two. All right, but quality control is something I cannot emphasize enough, but none of that is very interesting to talk about today, so I won't. What I'm going to talk about uh, in my presentation is really in the high level analysis, which is in my mind sort of the most statistically interesting part. Here we're actually drawing inference, we're actually drawing conclusions from our data that we've adequately processed and that we've done all sorts of stuff to make pretty a priori. All right, so here this involves things like clustering, where you might be interested in subgroup discovery and also uh, association analysis and correlation, where you're now correlating your features, your SNPs, all right, your gene expression values, your metabolites with outcomes of actual interest, such as disease status or a complex phenotype or trait. All right. Increasingly, I also work with a lot of investigators who are interested in predictive modeling. So, I won't say too much about that topic other than prediction is inherently very different from association analysis. And I think that's something that many investigators do not realize. Even though we call something a predictor, all right, it, a significant predictor, it does not mean it has any true predictive capacity. And that's something that people in, this, in the biostat department here are very familiar with and can give you a lot more information on. But I do want to emphasize that point. So these are some of the, th of the places where my group works, but, and we dabble with a lot of the different aspects of, of each of these. But what I really want to talk about is some of the work that we've been doing within the context of association analysis. That's to say, correlating phenotypes uh, with uh, various types of genomic features of interest. And in particular, I'm going to talk about two different projects that we've been working on. The first one, and both of them are connected in that the methodology used are, are pretty similar. So the first topic is really going to be about rare variant analysis and the analysis of next generation sequencing data where we're interested in, in testing for associations between complex phenotypes and rare genetic variation that exists within the population. And the strategy that we'll use is something that we call similarity based analysis uh, and which has actually become quite popular within this field. And then the second thing that I'm going to talk about is some work that we've been doing with regard to microbiome analysis. I know that many of you are much more familiar with microbiome than I am, but I'm going to talk about some of the improvements to existing methodology that we've been working on. And in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to extend microbiome analysis from this traditional framework where you analyze a few well-characterized samples to, to population-based studies in clinical settings where you now have hundreds and in, some, in our case sometimes even thousands of samples that you've profiled. And how you deal with that is very, very different from how uh, traditional analysis was done. All right. So onward for, to the first part of my presentation, where I'm going to be talking about statistical methods for rare variant association analysis. All right. So uh, the overall objective of this, of this part is really to talk about our work in developing a similarity-based test for rare variants, which allows for powerful testing of rare genetic variants. We want to allow these variants to have, uh, to have different uh, directionality in terms of their effects. So some variants can be protective, some can be, um, can be harmful. And we also allow for sparse signals, which is say not all rare genetic variants uh, are detriment, uh, have an effect on your particular phenotype. And so just a quick roadmap, I'll give a little bit of background on rare variant analysis. I'll talk about our, the methods that we've developed within this field. And then I'll just show a couple of quick simulations and uh, some data analysis to illustrate what I've been talking about here. So without further ado, some background, human genetics, one of the major goals of human genetics and modern human genetics is really to identify individual genes and genetic variants. And so here I'm talking about uh, germline variants that are associated with various complex phenotypes and outcomes. All right. And so traditionally, if by traditional we talk about 10 years ago or, or even six, seven years ago, the standard strategy was, was were these sort 
these GWAS, genome-wide association studies, which were characterized by genome-wide profiling of thousands, traditionally hundreds of thousands, and now millions of pre-selected single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. The focus was traditionally on common genetic variation with the, with the idea that this common genetic variability could explain much of the variation that we would anticipate in complex outcomes due to genetic components. And so now with modern genome, uh, GWAS technology, we can capture pretty much all of the common variants that are of interest to us. All right, this is really through the development of new technologies such as denser arrays and new statistical methods, which is to say imputation techniques, which allow us to capture the un ungenotyped genetic variants as well as the genotyped genetic variants. Okay, and but that being said, GWAS is old hat, and honestly, they really didn't find much that was very useful. So as is, as is how our field works, we move on to the next technology. And what's the newest, hottest thing? Sequencing analysis. And so the key difference that I really want to emphasize, of course, there's all sorts of interesting things going on with sequencing, is when we're dealing with this sort of germline, poly, uh, germline genetic variability, all right, it, sequencing now allows us to capture both common genetic variation as well as less common, that's to say rare genetic variability. All right? And so what, this, what I want to talk about now is how we analyze rare genetic variability with regard to complex phenotypes and traits. So what am I talking about with, with regard to rare variants? Again, I'm sure many of you know this already, but just as a quick review, in any standard genetic association study, we collect a whole bunch of people and we collect and we measure genotype on a whole bunch of people. So you might have a bunch of people who, so here's an example, there, you have a bunch of people in this study, all right, who are healthy controls, and then you might have some, some people in this study who have this horrible red box disease, all right? Oh, so maybe they're like mines, but anyway, um, and so you measure, and so, Traditionally, if we were interested in understanding the differences between these individuals, cases and controls based on their genetics, all right, we ran GWAS, all right, where you measured uh, the different, where you measured uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms at a few pre-selected locations along the genome, a few maybe a couple hundred thousand or five hundred thousand, and so you can see that these these places with the with the different colors and the underlined uh, letters, those are the places where people differ in the genome, where you and I tend to have different. Um, alleles there. And so with GWAS, you can capture some of those locations. All right. With modern GWAS, all right, including uh, modern techniques, imputation techniques, you can capture a lot more of the places where you and I uh, differ along the genome or where there's a lot of variability in the entire population. All right. But with sequencing, all right, but you don't get everything. But with sequencing, you pretty much do. All right. So now with sequencing, you can capture all of the places where you and I tend to di uh, are very different. So what's the difference be between GWAS and sequencing? All right. It's really in this guy over here. Genome-wide uh, association studies, they're very, very successful in capturing common genetic variability. But this guy over here, all right, everybody in the population has a C there, except for maybe one guy in, sorry, I should say everybody in the study has a C, but maybe one person, all right, has some, has a different allele. And so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about rare variants. That's to say most people in the population tend to have the exact same allele, but maybe one or two people have something a little bit different over there. So it's, it's, it's a SNP where the minor allele frequency is extremely low. All right. So why are we interested in rare variants? Well, the standard party line is, well, while GWAS have been fabulously successful in identifying over 1,500 or 2,000 uh, SNPs associated with a wide range of complex traits, all right, most of these discovered uh, disease-associated SNPs tend to have very, very small effect sizes. Not to say, individually, they don't inf increase risk by very much, and even collectively, they explain only a very small proportion of the total heritability, that's to say the variation that you would anticipate due to genetic factors. Right? And so, so there was for a, there's been for some time now an increasing belief that rare genetic variation, all right, that's to say variants with allele frequency less than 1 to 5% in the population, strongly influence heritable phenotypes. And this, can, this does make sense to some degree. You think that rare variants uh, are relatively new mutations within our genome, and so they haven't been subjected to the same, um, same selective pressures that common variants would. So you hope that maybe they tend to have stronger effects, and there's some evidence that this may be true, although we're also learning differently so far. 
But that being said, the question then that I'm interested in as a statistician, as a statistical scientist, is determining how do we test for associations between rare genetic variants and, and, uh, and phenotypes using this sequencing data. All right. And I'll tell you upfront that standard methods for analysis of, of, of GWAS, which is to analyze each SNP one at a time, tend to be extremely underpowered for rare variants. This is both due to the fact that you have a lot of rare variants and due to the, due to the fact that their allele frequency is very, very low. All right? The power to detect any single SNP as associated with an outcome is directly proportional to the minor allele frequency. If your minor allele frequency is low, that also means you have no power. Consequently, the current strategy for, for doing rare variant analysis is something that we call region-based analysis. So instead of analyzing each SNP at, one at a time, as you would in a GWAS study, the idea behind region-based analysis is you test for the cumulative effect of multiple multiple rare variants on a particular complex trait or outcome. So that's to say you group together a whole bunch of rare variants and test for their joint effect instead of looking at them marginally. And so this, people have been doing this since the late uh, 2000, uh, since around 2010. And some of the earliest methods were something that we call collapsing tests. The idea behind a collapsing test is for, for region-based analysis, is you, you do an aggregate analysis of multiple rare variants within the region, but then how do you actually do that? You aggregate them basically by collapsing it into a single variable. You summarize all of the rare variants within a region into a single variable. And so this operated based on a, a number of different ideas. The first one was that somebody proposed was that having any rare genetic variation within a particular region is going to be harmful. All right. Any rare variation within a particular gene between certain, within certain genes is going to be harmful. And so basically what they said was, if you have any rare variants within this region, I score you as a one. If you ha don't have any rare variants within this region, I score you as a zero. And then now I've collapsed all of the information within this region to a single number for each individual. Once you have a single number for each individual, the analysis is relatively straightforward. All right. So that was one of the first ideas that was proposed. The next, the, then people said, well, maybe it's not just whether or not you have any genetic rare variants within this region. Perhaps there's a dosage effect. Perhaps having more rare genetic variation uh, is, implies increased risk. So, th so then they said, well, maybe we can collapse this in a different way. Instead of, of, of uh, creating just this yes or no, do you have any rare variation in this region, we can create a dosage score, which base, which is basically just on uh, counting up the number of rare variants that you have within this region. And so this is just the mathematics behind it. All right, the first method is binary collapsing. All right, it, we call it binary collapsing because you collapse the, all of the variants within a region to just a single binary variable that's zero or one, yes or no, all right, based on whether or not you have any rare variants within the region. The next method is based count-based collapsing. This is sort of the dosage collapsing where you say, well, now I'm counting up the number of rare variants that you have within a particular region. And this is now going to summarize all right, the effect of the variants within this gene, within this exon, or, and so forth. All right. Well, the people extended this even further. They said, well, maybe not all rare variants within a region function equally. All right. It seems a little bit uh, premature to say that all variants here have the exact same effect, which is pretty much what you're doing with, do with dosage um, with, by doing just counting up the number of variants by, co by constructing this dosage. What they said was perhaps rarer variants are going to have larger effects. And which again makes sense based on what we w might guess from evolution, that if you have a rarer variant, it might have a larger effect. And so what they did was they created a weighted dosage, where basically you upweight for uh, the effects of of rarer variants. All right. And so we can do all of this. And these were some of the methods that were initially developed, but they had a number of huge limitations. All right. There, in particular, each of these methods operates under a number of, of key assumptions there, that are hidden, but that are inherently there. All right? And so as, so as I approached this problem, I looked at these existing methods and I said, well, they are great in some sense, but there are hidden assumptions which are not always obvious to the people using these approaches. 
The first assumption that underlies all of these methods is that all variants within a region are causal. That's to say, if you have a region, all of the, uh, a particular gene, then all of the rare variants within this gene are related to your particular outcome of interest. If you're analyzing height, then all of the variants within this gene are related to height. If you're analyzing breast cancer, then all of the variants within this region are related to breast cancer as well. All right, that may not be a reasonable assumption. The other thing is that all of the variants within this region ha have to have the same direction of effect. That's to say, all of the rare variability here increase risk for disease, or all of the rare variation here increases your quantitative phenotype or trait. Again, if you're dealing with disease, I can kind of believe that for some genes. All right, variation in your genome is especially rare, is probably going to be more, is more likely to be harmful than helpful. But to make this assumption is very difficult, particularly when you're talking about more benign outcomes or complex uh, quantitative traits of interest. And finally, there is an, ass as an assumption as well that all of the variants are going to have the same magnitude of effect. That's to say every single causal variant here, which is say every variant, all right, has, the ex has going to have the exact same effect on the outcome and, or that your weights perfectly capture their effects a priori. These assumptions are difficult to assess in practice and are honestly very not likely to hold true in any particular scenario. And so this motivated our development of a method that we call the sequence kernel association test, or SCAT, which is a new approach that we developed for rare variant analysis. The idea behind SCAT um, or this is that we do similarity-based analysis. All right. It was originally developed within the context of pathway analysis for gene expression data, and then later we extended it to the analysis of, G of, of uh, GWAS data and to do pathway analysis there. And actually, it's been widely used within that context. All right. And then we said, can we actually extend this to rare variant analysis? And the answer was yes. But then the intuition behind SCAT is that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be comparing pairwise similarity in phenotype between individuals to pairwise similarity in, ge in genotype between individuals. So we can measure similarity between you and me based on our phenotypes, okay, our height or disease status, if you, want, if you want, that's straightforward. And then what we do is we take a look at the variance within a particular region, and then we measure similarity, again, between you and me based on the variance within this region. And then we compare the similarity in genotype to similarity in phenotype. Now, if you and I have very similar phenotypes, and you and I also have very similar, uh, similar profiles in terms of the rare variants in this region, then that's suggestive of an association between phenotype, that's to say the variants in this region, and genotype as well. So we're comparing pairwise similarity in phenotype to pairwise similarity between individuals in their genotype. All right? And op that, the intuition behind that is relatively straightforward. All right? if you're similar in this way and also similar in this way, then that's suggestive that these two things are related. That's all. And that's the fundamental um, intuition behind SCAT. All right. Operationally, how do you measure similarity between any two individuals in terms of their genotype? Well, this is measured by way of a kernel, all right, which I'll describe a little bit further. But you can just view it as a similarity metric between any two individuals in your study. So you measure similarity between you and me using, based on the genetic variance, using something called a kernel. And if you want to go through all the mathy details, it, de it determines the form of the underlying trait model. Um, we can talk about all sorts of other mathy stuff, but I was told I probably should not. So I'll, I'll avoid that as much as possible. But I still have to show an equation because I'm a statistician. And just to prove it to you, here is an equation. All right? So SCAT uses a score statistic to generate a p-value. All right? And this is the score statistic over here. It's y minus its mean under the null times the kernel matrix times y minus its mean under the null divided by the standard deviation, where k is this stuff over here. All right. Totally meaningless for, mo for many people. But the idea here is that you estimate the you take away the, the effect of the covariates from your phenotype. So that's y minus y hat. All you're doing is taking away the effect of the covariates. K is a matrix of similarities between any two individuals in the study. All right, and again, you multiply it times, times your phenotype adjusted for the covariates over there. So what happens here is this quantity over here gives you similarity in your outcome, in your phenotype. This guy over here gives you similarity in your genetics. When you multiply them together, it gives you similarity in between the similarities, if you will. 
So this is our statistic, and I won't say too much more about it other than it allows for covariates, all right, it's, which are in, inherent inside of this guy over here. And we can use asymptotics to get a p-value. That means it's really, really fast, all right, if your sample size is big. We can do this really, really fast, okay? So how do you actually measure similarity then operationally? All I've said is we can get similarity somehow. You put it inside of this thing K and it does it. It magically works and that's exactly what it, it, how it works. But then how do you actually want to measure similarity? Well, one way is to measure similarity between any two individuals based on our rare variant profiles is just to, is just to estimate some sort of straightforward linear correlation. We just take the correlation, if you will, between you and uh, between these two sets of variables, and we can do that. All right. We can also take a weighted correlation where we weight, all right, for similarity between you and me based on rarer variants. So sorry, a little bit more equations over here, but basically, if you and I share more uh, rare alleles, then we up weight for that over there because we're interested in rare variants. Okay. So other types of ways of measuring similarity is to count up the number of alleles shared within this region between you and me based that are shared identi identically by state, all right? So IBS, all right? You, so you count up the number of, of, sh of, uh, of alleles shared IBS, and this is the similarity. Or you can also, again, up weight for the fact that sharing rarer alleles is likely to be more informative than sharing very common alleles, because everybody's going to share those anyway, OK? So these are just some ways of measuring similarity. You can just accept that it does work. But I'm a real statistician, so it's there. All right, so to validate our method, we first used a whole bunch of computer simulations. Um, we simulated sequencing data uh, using a coalescent population genetics model, which seemed reasonable and which actually is now commonly used. Um, we simulated, uh, we simulated um, 30 KB regions, are where there is approximately 626 tr num variants, of which the vast majority are rare. All right, and this seems to mimic real data in a reasonable manner, okay? And so th here's a type one error rate, so the false positive rate for our method. And we did all of this testing at the 10 to the minus six level, which of cor corresponds approximately to doing genome-wide significance if you're testing at the gene level. That's to say, you look at all of the rare variants within each gene and test for an association with the outcome there. And so if you have a continuous trait, all right, this is the type one error rate over here for different sample sizes. And this is if you have a binary tr out a trait, so disease status if you want. All right. And so you can see that at the 10 to the minus 6 level, the type 1 error rate is pretty close to correct. It's a little bit conservative, but not too bad. Uh, for binary traits, our initial version of this work, our initial scat test, was actually a little bit conservative. All right. And it, what we found was, but since then, we've made some, some additional technical adjustments that have corrected for this. But nonetheless, SCAT, our approach, does protect type 1 error. So, the so this is the false positive rate. It is controlled at the level that you would like it to be. You're never going to have more false positives than you would anticipate by chance. Okay? So, but what about false negatives? How do we deal with power? All right, so, well, we ran some simulations for power as well. So we simulated uh, 5KB regions, um, again, using this coalescent coalescent model. And so within this context, we have a number of different parameters that we can look at. All right. In particular, what is the effect of having different percentages of causal variants? That's to say you have a particular region, you have a whole bunch of rare variants in there. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to consider scenarios where we set 10% of the rare variants to be causal. That's to say associated with your phenotype of interest, 20% to be associated with your phenotype of interest, or 50% to be associated with your phenotype of interest. And then we also uh, also vary the percentage of the causal variants that increase risk. So we say, under the first scenario, we say, let's assume that all of the causal variants within this particular region uh, are harmful. And then we also consider a scenario where 80% of the variants within this region are harmful and 20% are protective. So just a couple of different parameters that we can, that we can look at. And then we compared the collapsing method um, and also SCAT. And so here are some simulation results. So in this first plot over here, all right, we considered sample sizes of 2,000 and 5,000. All right, the blue bar is basically one of the collapsing methods. It's actually the count-based collapsing or weighted count-based collapsing, which tends to work reasonably well. The gold bar is scat. And over here, what we've plotted is the power along the y-axis. And so you can see in this first scenario where all of your variants function unidirectionally, that's to say they all increase the trait value or increase risk. And 10% of them are causal. Scat tends to do a lot better than collapsing. 
in this scenario as well, where you're now allowing 20% of the variance within the region to be causal associated with your phenotype in truth. Again, SCAT does pretty well. Only when half of your variance, which is a huge proportion, are related to your phenotype of interest, all right, and they all function in the same direction, then these, the burden tests tend to win out. All right, because that's a scenario where they're designed to work. That's where the assumptions, the hidden assumptions were. If you, on the other hand, if you allow even a small proportion of the variance to be protective instead of harmful, then suddenly over here, SCAT uniformly wins. The red bar over here is something that we call SCAT O. I won't talk about it, but it's, it's a test that we've developed that works well in both scenarios where collapsing works and also where SCAT works. But that's beyond the scope of today's presentation. All right, so these are simulations, and it seems to work. What about in real data? Well, we applied our approach to the Dallas Heart Study data. So the Dallas Heart Study, it's a large-scale epidemiological study, and part of it, this uh, study, sorry, to identify determinants of atherosclerotic uh, heart disease. And so part of this study included a sequencing study, all right, where they sequenced uh, basically three genes the NGPTL, from the ANGPTL family, all right? So, and the outcome of interest here was quantitative triglyceride levels. So we also, for illustration, dichotomize these by taking the top and bottom quartiles. I do not recommend ever doing this in practice, but just for illustration of our method, I'll mention that you can do this. Um, and then the predictors, all right, the genetic variants. There were 93 observed variants within these, collectively within these three genes, which we just pulled together to analyze as a single region, even though they actually are not next to each other along the genome. And then we also adjusted for a whole bunch of other covariates. You want to adjust for confounders, all right? You want to make sure your differences are not due to differences in gender and ethnicity and that it's real. And so here are the, so we applied SCAT, we applied several of the collapsing methods, and here are our results. Okay, these are the p-values looking at the association between the 93 variants in the region and quantitative triglyceride levels and where we dichotomized the triglyceride levels. And you can see overall SCAT tends to be quite a bit more significant than, than these competing methods. All right, it's pretty close to dosage-based collapsing in this case, but overall does tend to still do a little bit better. So, and this reflects what we saw, that SCAT oftentimes does have higher power. All right and just validates what I'm talking about. So just a couple of remarks before I move on to microbiome. All right, there is a lot of interest right now in looking at, at rare variants within the context of genetic association analysis. And SCAT has actually become a very popular method for region-based analysis of rare variants, which is commonly used within a lot of the major uh, genetic association consortia. Right? And the reason why it's become popular is really that it does tend to have high power across a whole bunch of realistic scenarios, which can occur in practice. It allows for covariate adjustment. That's to say you can control for confounders, so you know your results are not just false positives due to imbalances in the number of males and females in your study. All right, It's robust to the direction of effect. That's to say it does not make assumptions concerning the a priori concerning the effect of the variance within the region, and we allow some sort of weights to, to exploit prior knowledge. And so this approach has been extended by us and by many others to do interaction analysis, um, joint analysis of common and rare variants, family-based data, other types of phenotypes like survival outcomes, longitudinal data, and also it's very popular, what an uh, area of considerable interest is meta-analysis. All right, what people are finding is even with rare variants and their larger effects, you're still not finding much. So maybe if we just collect more samples and meta-analyze them, we'll find something. I have mixed views on that, but it is what it is. What I will say, however, is that SCAT can be generalized to many other types of data. All it is is a framework for doing similarity-based analysis, all right? If you can measure similarity between you and me based on our outcomes and similarity between you and me based on some group of, var of, of variables, then this allows for uh, association between these t the, the omics data of interest and the outcome. And so consequently, we've applied this as well within the context of microbiome analysis over here. All right, so that motivates part two, where I'm going to talk a little bit about similarity-based methods for analysis of microbiome composition data. All right, and the idea here is we really want to do distance-based analysis of microbiome data that allows for covariate adjustment, that allows for testing across multiple distance and similarity metrics, and a topic I won't really touch on, but which I'll very briefly mention is interaction analysis, which is we want to test for synergistic effects between the microbiome and other types of variables, such as genetics, on an outcome of interest. And so that's something we can do 
but I won't talk about uh, too much. The methodology gets just way too mathematical to be interesting to most people. And so I'll so here's just a quick roadmap for this section. I'll give just a little bit of background. Again, many of you are much more familiar with microbiome than I am, I assume. And I'll talk about the, some of the standard methods for association analysis within this context. All right, and then I'll talk about similarity-based analysis. So the traditional approach is really based on distance, and but what we're proposing is to transform this to make it a similarity-based analysis problem. So the human microbiome. Well, so the human body contains about 10 to the 13th cells, all right, if you read, depending on who you talk with, but it contains about 10 to the 14th uh, bacteria. That's to say, within any of us, there is more bacteria than there are self cells. Consequently, there's been tremendous uh, interest in understanding the relationship between microbiome composition, that's to say, these populations and communities of bacteria living within us, and human health. And so there's all sorts of papers that have appeared in Science, Nature, um, and uh, in other top journals recently, all interested in understanding the role of microbiome in disease etiology. And so one study that I participated in, all right, is a very small study looking at fecal serine protease and the microbiome. So fecal serine protease, FSP, it's an important excitable neurotransmitter associated with pain and infl inflammation in IBS, all right? I don't really understand what that means, but that's what my physician collaborators tell me, and I'm willing to trust them over here because they're pretty smart. All right. So the study objectives here for this for the microbiome study were really to determine the, the origin of the FSP levels as measured within, uh, within the bowels. So the idea was to determine if, if fecal microbiome composition is associated with FSP levels while adjusting for other variables. So basically, all right, they collected, uh, they collected FSP levels on about 60 individuals. It's a pretty modest sample size. They measured the microbiome on all of these samples um, prior to pre-processing. But the issue was that they also have additional variables, all right? Things like age, sex, all right, BMI, and other types of variables. And so they wanted to be sure that some, uh, some associations that they observed using traditional methods still remained after accommodating for the differences in these other types of variables. All right, so how, did, how do you adjust out the effect of these additional covariates? Well, the standard approach right now, or a standard approach, I should say, for associating microbiome composition and a variable of interest is distance-based analysis. The idea here is you constructed a matrix of pairwise distances between any two individuals in the study, all right? And then what you do is you can create an F statistic that says, well, are people with similar outcomes? So then you look at the, at the distribution of distances for people who share the same uh, outcome and for people who, and across uh, people who have different outcomes over here and evaluate significance via permutation. So here's just an example. This is plotting the first and second principal uh, coordinates of a distance ma uh, matrix. So basically what you do is you see are all of the green dots, all right, which is, are people with one particular outcome, more clustered together as compared to the distance between uh, the green and the red clusters over here. So that's the idea behind it. You're, you're constructing distances between individuals and then you look to see all right if the distances among people within who share the same outcome all right is different than the the distribution of distances across people who have uh, different outcomes that's the intuition okay and you have to do permutation which is pretty computationally expensive in order to to get significance one of the limitations of this however is that it's not trivial to adjust for covariates that's to say you cannot easily always easily adjust for confounding in this case all right due to the need for permutation analysis all right another problem is that is so dif distance based analysis it is very popular but it was really designed in the scenario where you collected a very modest number of samples under very controlled scenarios. That's to say you had a few mice, all right, which you could grow in very controlled environments. But as the field of microbiome analysis is moving towards population-based and clinical studies, you have to be a little bit more careful. You can no longer control human subjects in the exact same way that you might control animals. All right? When you're dealing with thousands of, of patient samples, it's very, very different than dealing with just 10 mice or, t or uh, even mo more modest numbers. So 
in particular, covariate adjustment, as I said, is a major challenge. And then another challenge that, that is really quite practical is, what is the appropriate distance metric to use within the context of microbiome analysis? And so here, all right, this is the same plot as before, except constructed based on a whole bunch of different distances. So depending on the particular distance, you see over here, you have very good separation between the red and the green. But then in other, in other, using other distances, everything smears together, much more together. So your results all right, are going to depend very strongly upon the distance approach that you choose to take. All right? So you can pick the best, but then that's basically going to be equivalent to cooking the books. All right? You're going to end up with a huge number of false positives. So what we decided was, let's, let's take an alternative approach to distance-based analysis and apply SCAT. So you'll recall from just the earlier, that's the main idea behind SCAT is you compare pairwise similarity in the outcome between patients to pairwise similarity in their DNA sequence profiles, and then ask the question, does similarity in outcome correlate with similarity in the sequence profiles? To transform this within the context of microbiome analysis, very straightforward. So SCAT for SCAT, all right, the main idea here is we compare pairwise similarity in the outcome again to pairwise similarity in microbiome profiles, and again, ask the exact same question. Does similarity in outcome correlate with similarity in microbiome profiles? Again, if, this, if there's some correlation there, then that's, a, again, is a suggestive of an association between your outcome, all right, and your microbiome composition. All right. The statistic is exactly the same as before, where again, you have some sort of covariate adjusted outcome. All right. And then you have similarity between any two subjects in your study based on their microbiome composition. The difficulty here is how do you actually measure similarity based on microbiome composition? All right. So again, you have, you have to have come up with a metric for measuring similarity uh, based on microbiome. And our, uh, our solution is very, very straightforward. Basically, all right, there are a whole bunch of these existing uh, distance metrics for measuring similarity between any two individuals' microbiome, com my, uh, microbial communities, and if it's just a distance. How, so a bigger number implies that they are more further apart. But if you just take the inverse of this in some way, so either subtracted, uh, one minus this, then it actually becomes a similarity. So a big number, once you take a negative, just becomes really, really small. All right, and so consequently, you're it's very straightforward to transform uh, similarity, a distance, to become similarity. I mean, what we operationally do is a little bit more complicated than this, but not really, not by much. Okay, so we're going to construct similarity based on existing distance metrics. All right. So if you take a unifract distance, which is computed by looking at the fraction of branches of the phylogenetic tree present in the, in the community for person I, or for person I prime, so two different people in the study, but not both, that's unifract distance, we can construct a unifract similarity using the by just taking the distance and basically inverting it. All right, we can construct a weighted unifract distance in the same way, and there's all sorts of other distances that have been developed for microbiome analysis, which you can again transform to become similarities in the exact same manner. All right. So what is the, what is the advantage of doing similarity-based analysis versus the standard distance-based analysis? Well, I'll tell you right now, if you have no covariates, then the two approaches are identical. They are statistically equivalent, all right, except for the fact that in, in, by doing similarity-based analysis, I don't have to do permutation. So it's a lot faster, okay? So I can analytically give you a p-value based on some sort of asymptotic results, which works out reasonably well. The second thing is that by doing similarity-based analysis, recasting it as a regression-based problem, right, I can actually do covariate adjustment over here. So I can now adjust for potential confounders and, and differences between you and me that are not based on microbiome and that are really through other pathways. Okay. And finally, what we'll show is that we can also use existing method work within the kernel framework, within the similarity analysis framework, to allow us to choose an appropriate, to optimize over an appropriate sim distance metric. So the question that, so the second question, so the first question I should say that I wanted to answer was how do we adjust for covariates and deal with the fact that we're dealing with population-based studies? The second thing I wanted to deal with was how do we choose an appropriate distance similarity metric up front? So choosing the right similarity or distance metric can dramatically influence your power. So at this point, distance and similarity can be used interchangeably because you can transform one to be the other and backwards and forwards however you want to do it. 
So diff different distances and similarities are designed for different scenarios, all right? Each of which can really happen in practice, okay? Depending on your particular outcome of interest and your data. And it's really difficult to determine a priori what's going on. If you knew a priori what's going on, then that would mean you don't have to do any data analysis because you already have the answer before running your study. So you never know a priori what's happening. You can hypothesize, but you never know. You can choose, you can consider multiple distance metrics and then just give you, take the lowest p-value. And this is something that some of my collaborators have done in the past, but I'll tell you upfront that this is equivalent to cooking the books, all right? All you, by do, taking the most significant p-value, you're dramatically inflating your false positive rate. And most of what you'd find if you take this sort of approach will probably not hold up under replication. And that is something that uh, some people care about and other people apparently do not. But I'm going to assume that that's a terrible, terrible thing. And I hope you do too. All right, false positives, not a good thing, but well, I guess people need to eat. All right, which is why they do it, but I still think it's stupid. To me, a negative result is better than a wrong result, but well, it is what it is. All right, so the objective here is we're gonna create an omnibus test that works acro well across a whole range of different similarity and distance metrics. The question is how? The idea is very, very simple, all right? What we're going to do is something that's called perturbation analysis, which is less simple, but the idea behind it is relatively straightforward. The idea is that we're gonna pick the best distance and sim similarity metric, which is what I said you shouldn't do, but then we're gonna pick the best one, but then we're gonna correct for having taken the best one, all right? So operationally, what we do is we consider each of the distance metrics one at a time, all right? And then we take the p-value that, that is most significant from looking across these, these three or four or up to 10 different or more different distance metrics. But instead of interpreting this p-value as a p-value, all right, we know that that's invalid because you're going to have inflated type one error and inflated false positives. We now treat it as a statistic, okay? So it's no longer a p-value, it's just a statistic for, for measuring, uh, for, for quantifying things, all right? And then we get a final p-value by using perturbation analysis. So basically, we perturb our original statistics. So y minus y hat, in, under the null hypothesis, should be, should be normal. And we basically replace it with a whole bunch of random normals, all right? And then with this randomly uh, perturbed statistic, we again recalculate the p-values, all right? But now it's, our data have been perturbed, okay? And so you can get a p-value under each of these candidate similarity metrics, all right? And you can take the minimum p-value fr from these candidates using the perturbed data. We repeat this a whole bunch of times, and then a final p-value is now computed as the proportion of per perturbation p-values that exceed uh, the original in significance, okay? So basically, it's like a permutation type test where you're using the p-value as your statistic. So we, cons so we ran some simulations to evaluate this approach. We considered, we simulated realist data based on some real data, all right, which, well, we can argue has heads or tails about whether or not this is a good simulation framework, but we can do it. And we consider two scenarios, one where there's no covariates, all right, so why just our outcome is quantitative, just depends on some covariates. And we also considered a scenario where we do have covariates. And here are our results, all right. So, over here, KMR, this re refers to kernel-based methods and is looking at similarity. This is distance-based analysis over here. And this B equals zero means that we're under the null. Microbiome does not influence outcome. And you see everybody protects the type one error rate if uh, there are no covariates. If we look at power, then kernel machine analysis, di similarity-based analysis and distance-based analysis have the exact same power because the two methods are equivalent over under this scenario. Okay, and so this last, but which, which distance metric you choose, each of those is represented by a different bar, does influence power. If you choose the right one, you've got great power. If you choose the wrong one, you have terrible power. This last bar over here corresponds to the omnibus test, which searches across all of them. It will never do the best, but it'll also always be a lot better than picking the worst uh, distance metric. So you're hedging against that over there. With covariates over here, Ignore this part, it's not even meaningful. This is distance-based analysis. Uh, sorry, this is distance-based analysis. This is similarity-based analysis, all right? Everything that, that over here is a false positive. And you can see distance-based analysis has huge false positive rates if you have covariates that, you are, that are not appropriately adjusted for. So you need to, uh, to accommodate covariates in order to make meaningful inference. All right, so just we applied this to our actual data 
for over here. So 60 individuals, FSP levels are our outcomes. These are the results from an unadjusted analysis. So if you ran the distance-based analysis using unifract distance, you got a p-value that was marginally significant at 0.01. All right, if you use weighted unifract or Bray Curtis, your p-values were not significant. So this is challenging in two respects. First of all, we haven't adjusted for covariates. And secondly, all right, we don't know if our significance, uh, we don't know, all right, is it because we picked unifract and, and and looked at too many distance metrics over here. How do I accommodate the fact that you have three distance metrics which give you different results over here? Well, so we ran uh, the covariate adjusted analysis using similarity based analysis. And with Unifrac, you end up with even more statistical significance, which does happen if you've correctly adjusted for covariates. You actually gain power by doing this. But again, all right, we have difficulties in interpretation because using weighted Unifrac distance and Bray Curtis, we end up with insignificance again. But under the omnibus test, all right, we end up with a p-value of 0.0155, which is still significant at the 0.05 level, making uh, it a little bit easier to interpret. So just a couple of remarks before I stop. All right, what we propose in the second section is, is really a similarity-based analysis for uh, microbiome analysis, which overcomes some of the difficulties associated with traditional um, microbiome analysis frameworks. All right, so we can establish a close relationship between SCAT and distance-based analysis, and then we can exploit the, uh, the advantages of SCAT in order to do things that we might be interested in within the context of this other types of omics data. And so I'll just end uh, with a couple of acknowledgments. So th these are the members of my research team. Um, I run at Dry Lab, and these are some of the students that have helped me. Um, I'm missing a couple of people, but well, these are the ones for whom I have pictures. And other people who have participated in this work include uh, my collaborators at UNC and Harvard and Michigan. And this is our funding. All right, thank you. And I'm sorry for going over. Yes. I'm so sorry. Kapula? Oh, copula, copula. Uh, I don't know that people have, have done it within this context. I mean, I think it, within this framework, sometimes it's a little bit challenging, actually. Yeah, I mean, your, your dimensionality is, is, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I know I've heard of people doing it um, to make things independent, and then they can apply Fisher's method um, for vi within the context of genetic analysis. But I haven't really seen much with regard to analysis of other types of data. Um, I don't know that there's any reason not to use it besides dimensionality. But yeah, operationally, I just haven't seen it used. Yes, it, and it's fully non-parametric in some sense. You can view it, and I so I do like it, but I I just don't know enough. Of, uh, I just haven't seen it. Yeah. Yes. 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 It's, it's different because this is your predictor now. So it's, it's your predictor. So, no, 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 but what I mean is it's on the other side of your equation. So all I'm doing is I'm, I'm regressing my outcome on this count instead. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, so in principle, you could consider modeling it, but I don't know that there's much gain to be had over that. Um, because the inherent assumption there is that you're just having more rare variants over there is going to be detrimental in some sense or another. Um, I'm not quite sure I, I fully understand. So you're saying you assume a certain mutation rate within there, and then you can model it further? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I haven't seen that done. Uh, maybe some Bayesians have done it. I, I have no idea, actually, with regard to that particular application. Um, honestly, people are not using it anymore. Uh, for the most part, we use um, this sort of, we tend to prefer a SCAT. Uh, that's actually the de facto standard within most, not most, many analyti analytical um, pipelines. Yeah. Time for one more question. 
whoever. Um, so far, what you're doing is still only looking at each gene variant individually? Uh, no, it's a group of genetic variants, but they have to be, they're usually grouped based on some sort of prior knowledge, and so usually that's within a particular region, but it is still just a single gene at a time, so or a single so region. If, if there's an interaction between the genes, that, there's, there's still no way to pick that up? Between, across genes, no. Okay. I mean, you hope that the interaction effect is going to trickle into the main effect. I mean, you know, by testing the main effect, you oftentimes will capture interaction as well. But uh, we do not explicitly test for that. Operationally, we can do that, but it's actually harder than it seems. Um, the reason is that by testing interactions, all right, you now have to capture the null model. And estimating the null model is not necessarily trivial. Um, all of the estimation under these types of frameworks are, are inherently biased. And so your type 1 error rate sometimes suffers because of that. Yeah. Well, I thank Dr. Wu for coming in. Thank you all for, yeah. for attending. Thanks.